Well, if you'll turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to James chapter 1, we're going to be continuing our, our series this morning on putting faith into practice. And as you turn there, my wife reminded me a little bit ago that a little over, well, seven year, a little over seven years ago was when I finally surrendered to God's call on my life to serve in the pastorate and to quit running from that call. And that's late summer, seven years ago, I had the chance to fill a pulpit in Concha. And it just so happened that seven years ago, on this very Sunday, I was preaching this same text. And the church there in Tecancha was was so excited and they were so good, they wanted to encourage me. They put out on the marquee sign out front, special guest, Roy Henry, Enduring Temptation. <laughs> so I guess people came for a show. I'm not sure what they were, you know. Uh, boy, uh, I appreciated that, but my goodness, it, the choice of wording and order of words matter. So anyway, this morning, uh, let me ask you a question. Isn't it great to be a Christian? Amen. Yes, you can say amen. You can say it loud. I know we've got a lot of folks who are gone on vacation and, and traveling right now, but, but it is great to be a Christian. It is great to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And isn't it great that once you become saved, once you become a Christian, you no longer have to face temptation of any sort? Oh, that's not the way it works? No, we do, right? We do face temptation. I'm glad no one responded amen to that second question, but uh, anyway. In his book, Men at Work, George Will, the political commentator, he took a close look at four baseball players, and, and one of those that he examined was a man named Oral Hershiser. He played for the Dodgers. He was a pitcher. Some of you may remember him. Uh, he was called the Bulldog, and, and I remember him well. Uh, but he talked about his philosophy of preaching, uh, of pitching, in that interview, he said, there are two theories of pitching. One is that you try to convince the batter that a particular pitch is coming, and then you throw something different. The other theory that you don't hear as much, but that I use, is that if the batter expects a particular pitch, you throw it, but you throw it in a place where he can't hit it. Isn't that temptation? It's what we want, but it's in just a spot where we can't get it. And that's the way the enemy works in our life. He throws it just a little higher, a little bit more outside than what we can reach. But we try for it anyway. We just can't seem to lay off of it. It looks so good. It feels so right. And we go after it. That's temptation. So what do we do? How do we lay off the high stuff? How do we uh, resist temptation? Well, in our passage this morning from James, we're going to see the answers to some of these most pressing questions regarding temptation. We're going to see why temptation exists, where it comes from, what it can produce, and most importantly, how we can endure it. So will you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word, James chapter 1, starting in verse 12 and reading through verse 18. The apostle writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Gracious Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it tells us about where temptation comes from and how we can endure it. 
Father, I thank you that you have given us every good and perfect gift that we might be able to use those in resisting the wiles of our adversary, the devil. Father, as we study your word this morning, I pray that its truth seeps into our hearts and our minds, and it's, it's something that we can't let go of. It's something that goes with us each and every day going forward, that we might be better stewards of the grace that you have given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name we ask these things. Amen. Now, the first question I want us to think about this morning is, why does temptation exist? Well, the first and primary answer is, of course, that we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is marred by the sin of Adam and Eve when they were deceived by Satan in the garden to disobey God and his commandment to not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They sinned, and they brought into this world sin, and it has affected everything and so Satan has been using that same device of temptation on all of us ever since. He's been working hard to lead us down the path of destruction, and often he succeeds at it, doesn't he? Often we give in to temptation. That's the first reason it's there. But there's something else I want you to see about temptation, something that's actually encouraging about it. And that is this. God has taken a tool that is used by our adversary Satan, and he can use it to build us up, to develop in us perseverance and endurance. Look with me at verse 12. He, uh, James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And James is echoing what he had said just a few verses earlier in verse 3, where he says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And that steadfastness is understood as endurance, or perseverance, it's, it's standing firm over time. And as we endure temptations that come our way and the trials that come our way, we learn how to persevere. And as we learn how to persevere, our faith matures. We grow in our faith. So God uses this tool of the devil to actually bring about something good in us. What, what Satan wants to use for evil, God turns around and uses for good. And so Paul can say in Romans 5, 3 through 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And when Paul's talking about sufferings here, he's talking about all of those pressures that come onto us, whether it's, whether it's persecution, whether it's temptation, whether it's the trials that we go through. And when we become Christians, we move out of the kingdom of the world and we move into God's kingdom, right? We become citizens of his kingdom, citizens of heaven. And as such, we become enemies with the world. And so the ruler of this world is going to aim at us. There's no doubt about that. Christ told us in the Sermon on the Mount that we would be persecuted because of the relationship that we have with him. And we see that today, don't we? We see more and more believers undergoing persecution for what they believe. And it's not just in places like North Korea and China and Iran and, and the Middle East and, and places in Africa. It's starting to happen right here in the United States, a place where many had thought it would never happen. But look at what Paul says about that persecution, about that pressure that we go through. It produces endurance, which produces character, which produces hope. That is the maturing process in spiritual life. But James goes on to show us that as we endure temptation, as we uh, gain endurance and patience, we also gain approval. 
Whose approval do we gain? God's approval. Look here again in verse 12. He says, For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. This is it. The person who endures temptation is the person whose trust in God has persevered. Their faith has been made strong, and God provides that person with his approval. It's a mark of maturity within the believer. Now, that doesn't mean that a Christian is always going to resist temptation, right? We all slip sometimes. The temptation can be great in our lives, and, and we, we succumb to it. Sanctification takes time. But the pattern is, if you are a true believer in Christ, you will constantly be growing in your endurance, growing in your ability to resist that temptation. Think about it in the term of athletics. If you want to be a marathon runner, and I don't know why you would, but there are some who do. I know my brother Bob runs marathons. Good for him. I am, I'm not. I'm not geared that way. But if you want to run a marathon, do you go out and run a marathon? Absolutely not. You don't have the endurance for it, right? You have to build that up. And so you start off by running shorter distances. And then you start extending that distance a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more until you can run that full 26.1 miles. And so it is in our, our life, right? It, it's, it's something that we build up to. It's sanctification that takes time that's building up in us. So it's no wonder that James uses an athletic metaphor here when he talks about the crown of life. That word that he uses for crown is not the royal crown. It's not the diadem. It is the Stephanos. It is the, the crown, the, the wreath of laurels that was given to the person who did well in an athletic event. Think about the Olympics the early Olympics, the Greek Olympics, right? When, when somebody won, they didn't get a gold medal or a bronze medal. They got a wreath of laurel that was placed on their head, a crown. And that signified that they had won, that they had succeeded in their event. And that's what James is referencing here. He's saying that our victory crown is eternal life. Now, when we think about the perseverance of a true believer, I think the prototypical example is Job. And if you were in Sunday school, you, you were learning about Job. We often use that term, the patience of Job, don't we, to, to describe somebody who is able to endure even when everything in the world seems to be coming down on them. Everything, all the pressure of the world, all the temptations, all the trials is hitting them at once, but they're able to withstand. They're able to persevere. Job lost everything, didn't he? He lost his home. He lost his livestock. He lost his children. The only thing that Job didn't lose was his wife. But that wasn't necessarily the best thing. I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying that Satan was able to use her as a means of temptation to Job as well because in the midst of everything that Job went through, when his wife should have been coming up to encourage him and support him, she said, curse God and die. That's what you should do. And yet, and yet, listen to what happened. You see, when everything was going wrong, Job could have very easily have been tempted to do just that. When he lost his health, when he lost everything, he could have cursed God and died, but his faith was strong. Listen to what is recorded in Job 1, 20 through 22. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. He didn't fall on the ground and cry. He didn't fall on the ground and throw a pity party. He fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then listen to this. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Now, it's not that Job was without sin. Job was a sinful person just like you and me. But 
He placed his faith completely in the true and living God for his redemption, and he lived a life that sincerely honored God. And he did so in faith, just as every one of us must do who is going to be saved. He did not blame God for the temptation to sin in his life. He didn't blame God for what happened to him. He maintained his faith. And the example of Job actually provides us a nice segue into the second point I want to make this morning, which is where temptation comes from. Look at, at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Job is a great example of this. Listen to what was going on behind the scenes. In Job 1, 6 through 12, we read, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and the possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face." And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there's enough in there for a few good sermons, but I just want to point out a couple of quick things to you. Okay, first of all, did you notice the approval that Job had? Job had lived a blameless and upright life. He was living according to what God had commanded he was living faithfully. And so when Satan was wandering around on the earth, God said, did you consider my, my man Job? Did you consider how he is and how good he is? And Job was not sinless, but he had placed his faith in God. And his faith was counted as righteousness, just as your faith is, just as my faith is, just as Abraham's faith was, and everyone who is saved. But second, notice J uh, Satan's response. One of the titles that Satan has is he's the accuser of the brethren. And he lives up to it in this passage, doesn't he? He says, oh, really, Job? Yeah, he he's, lives a pretty good life because you've given him all kinds of stuff. You've given him riches. You've given him material wealth. You've given him great health. If you took all those things away, he would curse you to your face. If you give him good things, he'll worship you. If you take them away, he'll hate you. That's what Satan was saying. And notice that Satan wants God to do this. Satan wants God to do this evil act, but God is not tempted, is he? God will not do it because God cannot be tempted by evil, nor will he tempt anyone which is exactly what James tells us. So temptation does not come from God, but it is allowed by God. That does happen. And it happens so that we can build endurance and perseverance. But notice that Satan's power is limited. He cannot do anything without God's permission first. Now, look with me at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. You know, the mantra that we hear from the world so often today is just follow your heart. Do what feels right. Follow your heart. Frank Sinatra, the great crooner, once sang that he did it his way, right? He followed his heart. He followed his inclinations, and he did it his way. But Scripture speaks a little differently, doesn't it? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. James here refers to our own lusts when he says that we are lured and enticed by our own desires. 
And when we think about that term lust, we often think of it with a sexual connotation, don't we? And, and that's an accurate description, but it's an incomplete description. You see, lust is just the desire we have within us to fulfill our flesh and our fleshly desires. Now, sometimes that may mean a sexual situation, but it doesn't have to. Some people lust after wealth. Some people lust after power. Some people lust after material possessions. There are plenty of lusts. If there is something in the world, people can lust after it. That's it. We need to recognize what they are because James points out to us that we are all lured and enticed by our own desire, which indicates that what is a temptation to you may not be a temptation to the next person. What's a temptation to me is not necessarily a temptation to my wife. We have different desires. You know, one of the great long and ongoing debates in psychology is what shapes a person. Is it nature or is it nurture? Do you belong to the Skinner camp or the Erickson camp in, in psychology? That's the idea. And, and they say, some say it's nature, that you inherit certain genes and that creates who you are and what your desires are, and it's all determined by nature. And others say, no, you're born a blank slate, and you have impressed upon you all kinds of things from your family, from society, from the culture you live in, and so that's what shapes your desires and your wants and your, uh, your, your uh, lusts, so to speak. Well, academics like to paint things in pure black and white sometimes. The truth on this is somewhere in the middle. It is that we are both shaped by our nature and by our nurture. That's what happens. Some of us inherit certain desires. I think alcoholism is a good example of that. Some people, there is a gene that they have discovered that can... Uh, make people uh, predisposed to alcoholism. That's a nature situation. But how we're raised by our parents, what they focus us on, that helps us as well to develop our likes and our dislikes. And so we're impacted by all of these things, but what that means is that each one of us has different desires. Each one of us is going to have different temptations. For instance, Electronic gadgets are a great temptation to me. I know this. They don't tempt my wife at all. She can walk right by that aisle in the store and not even look down it. I can't. That's a strong temptation to me. So we all are, are designed a little bit differently. Our flesh is weak, and so we must constantly be striving to subdue the desires that it produces when they're sinful desires. Paul knew this. He wrote to the Romans, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. You know, when we're saved... There's still a struggle against the flesh. We're still working to subdue the flesh. That inner person is regenerated. He's new. He's a new creation. Praise God for that. But the flesh is still there, and we still battle it. We still battle it. But when we're truly saved, that inner person longs to please God. He longs to follow his commandments. And as a result... You have a constant war between the inner self and the flesh. There's that temptation that still takes place. And that war is going to be exploited by our adversary. I have said a lot, and, and I believe it to be absolutely true, that Satan is the greatest student of human psychology and sociology that has ever existed. He has studied the human race he knows what our weaknesses are. He knows what is a, a temptation. And it's our own desires and temptations that he uses against us. He's not going to waste his time trying to tempt you with something that doesn't work on you. He doesn't waste time. He knows time is short. And, and I think it's interesting that James uses 
some fishing analogies here in this passage. He uses lured and enticed. And lured in the Greek means to catch with bait. And the word enticed means to drag away. And so what he's saying is that there's a lure in the water with bait on it. And as soon as that hook gets set, you get dragged out. You get dragged away. Now, I really enjoy fishing. I'm not very good at it. I'm not participating in any bass tournaments. But I enjoy fishing. I like getting the line wet. It's just a relaxing thing to me. It's, it's a lot of fun. And even if I just go out and cast the, the line several times and get no bites, I'm still pretty happy. It's, it's a good thing. But even though I'm not very good, I'm aware of what it is I'm trying to fish for. I'm aware of the fish I'm going for. I'm aware of the environment that I'm in. If I'm in shallow water, I'm not going to use a deep water lure that sinks all the way down to the bottom. If I'm looking for fish in the deeper water, I'm not going to use a surface skimmer, right? I'm going to use the bait that is appropriate to the fish that I'm trying, theoretically, to catch. And I'm going to choose my bait accordingly. And this is what we see happen with temptation. Think about Jesus in the wilderness when he was tempted by Satan in Matthew 4. What's the first thing that Satan tempts him with? Food. Why? Because Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and he had come out of the wilderness. And if you've been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, you're hungry. You are hungry, and so Jesus, being 100% human and 100% divine, he's both at once. He's still got that human body. He still feels that hunger. And Satan is going to leverage the temptation that he thinks is going to work best. And so he brings out bread. That's what he's trying to do. And so it will be with you. That is what Satan does. Our enemy is wily. He's cunning. And he's diabolical in the truest sense of the term. He's going to use lures from your own tackle box to try to entice you into sin. And that is why we need to pay attention to Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Now that James has shown us why temptation exists and, and where temptation comes from, he now turns to what temptation can produce. And, and just as I pay attention to the conditions that are existing in the lake or the stream that I'm fishing in, uh, so our adversary does as well. Our adversary develops a strategy for fishing for us. And we can sum up his strategy as LSD. I'm not talking about the psychotropic drug, okay? I'm not talking about hallucinations. I'm talking about lust that leads to sin that leads to death. LSD. That's his pattern. Uh, this is the same as what we see in Job 15.35. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. You see, once sin has been born, it produces death. That's what Paul says in Romans uh, 6.23. The wages of sin is death. It's a process that begins in our desires. It begins in our lusts. And that's an inherent part of our physical and mental makeup. Sometimes we drive past a car dealership and we see something, and, and maybe that, that sports car or that big SUV, it, it causes us to lust for it. Or, or maybe we see that jewelry case and, and there's a watch or a necklace that's in there. But once we have the desire, once the desire has been created, then we move on to the second stage, deception. Because, you see, once we have a desire in our head, our mind will try to rationalize and provide a justification for why you should have it, why you should get it. It's a deception, and, and this happens all the time. It, it happens with us. Uh, I think of the fish that sees the bait in the water, but he can also see the hook on there as well. And that desire for the bait is so strong, he rationalizes away the hook. And that's what we do as well. It's amazing how quickly and almost automatically we do it. We discount 
the danger that's involved with following that desire. We follow we, that, that lust. We, we discount it. Friendships may be destroyed. Marriages may be wrecked. Finances may be ruined. But we do not consider those things in our rationalization. We want what we want, and we tell ourselves we deserve it and that we're going to have it. And once that's happened, our desire has conceived sin. But it doesn't stop there. Once we have the justification for why we should fulfill this lust of the flesh, whatever it may be, we begin to design a plan. How are we going to get the object of our lust? We should note at this point our will has become involved. Sometimes we can't control the desires we have. I like shiny things. I do. Now, I can resist that temptation. I don't have to go out and spend my whole paycheck on the latest and greatest TV or iPad or, or whatever may be out there. But that desire is there. But once we move into designing a plan for how we're going to get that, our will has become involved. And we're going to involve our will. It becomes a conscious choice that we're making. We're going to pursue that object of our lust. But the final step in the process is disobedience. If we allow the process to continue to its end without stepping in and stopping it, it will lead to disobedience. It will lead to disobeying God's commandments, which is, of course, sin. This is the process as James describes it. Desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. So desire leads to deception. Deception leads to design, and design leads to disobedience. It is a gestation period, and the longer we wait in that process, the harder it is to resist the temptation that we face. We want to nip it in the bud. So it follows that where we should begin in resisting and enduring temptation, knowing what it can produce, which is death, we need to nip it early, and we need to do so by not being in situations or being around influence that would lead us into that temptation. Do you struggle with the use of language, bad language, coarse language, vulgar language? If you do, don't watch movies or listen to music or be around people who curse like sailors because what will happen in that is it will cause you to do it. Do you struggle with buying things on, on your credit card, maxing out your credit card? Don't take your credit card to the store with you. Leave it at home. Resist that temptation. Don't even go into that temptation. Do you have a problem with remaining sexually pure? Don't allow yourself to be in a situation where it is easy to fulfill those desires, those lustful desires. In other words, don't go into the bedroom and shut the door with your significant other with no one around. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Now, we're not going to be able to block every single impulse we have, but we can win the battle of the mind with the tool that God has provided us, his word. We have it, and we'll see in a moment just how we can implement that. But folks, this is important. Because James points out sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, for the unsaved person, this means the spiritual death, that eternal separation from God in hell. That is what he's referring to. That's, that's what Paul refers to with the wages of sin is death. But remember, James is not speaking to the unsaved in this letter. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to believers. And so what does he mean here? Friends, it is hard for us to hear sometimes, but one of the judgments that God can use against a believer is a shortened life. If you don't believe me, think about what Paul said to the first Corinthians when he was discussing the Lord's Supper and their implementation of it. They were abusing it. They were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. They were not taking care and reverence with the elements that symbolize the body and blood of Jesus Christ broken for us, blood shed for the remission of our sins, they weren't taking care of it. And Paul said, because of that, some of you are sick and some of you have died. God's judgment came. Think about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. Listen, uh, they had sold a piece of land and they said they were going to give the money from the proceeds to God 
But they didn't. They kept some of the money for themselves. And Peter discerned that. Listen to what happened in Acts 5. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. And then a few verses later, we find out that Sapphira, his wife, came in and lied also. And when she was confronted, she fell dead as well, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all those who heard these things. I'm reminded of an uh, account that the pastor, Adrian Rogers, many of you know uh, Pastor Rogers passed away several years ago, a uh, great man of God, but he spoke about a deacon at his church many years ago who had fallen into a pattern of sin, a life of sin, and he was confronted by Dr. Rogers, and Dr. Rogers said this lovingly, as, as Ephesians tells us to, speaking the truth in love, he went to him, and this deacon said, I'm not going to change. And Dr. Rogers said he pled with the man. He pled in tears with the man to see his sin, and the man said, I know it is wrong. I know what the Bible says, and I don't care. I'm not changing. And Dr. Rogers said that one week later, he got a call that that man dropped dead of a heart attack. Now, it is not for us to say that that was God's judgment on the man, but we do know that there is a sin unto death, and that sin is what James is talking about here. Do not allow sin when, it is when, when your desire is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown, when you allow it to go unchecked, it brings forth death. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. So how can we endure temptation? How can we do that? Thank God he has not put us in a position to where we have to face temptations like this to sin without also providing us a means by which we can endure it. Praise God for that. Look with me in verses 16 through 18. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Again, James draws our attention here to the fact that God is not tempting us with evil because God is good. God is perfect. We have that promise here. Thank God for that. We must remember not to blame God when temptations come our way in life. Don't blame him for the temptation we face. We've already seen that our tempt we get enough temptations from our own tackle box, don't we? They're all there already. Don't blame God for that. Because to suggest that God is the author of your temptation is not only to malign his good and perfect character, it is to undermine your faith in him. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. If you say, God tempted me to do this, You've maligned his character. You've said that he has tempted you with evil, which means he has evil to tempt you with. So you've maligned his character. But what does that do to your faith in a good and holy and perfect God? If God is the one who tempted you, it undermines it. It tells you that he is not who he says he is. And if he's not who he says he is here, is he who he says he is elsewhere? Will he do what he said he will do in other places? That crack in the foundation of your faith will only grow when you ascribe to God temptation. It is simply not who he is. He did not send you temptation, but he has provided you with the means by which you can endure that temptation. 
by the means by which you can live through it. It's for that reason Paul could write in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and brothers and sisters, I praise God for this promise. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But the, with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God is faithful, church. God is faithful. He's not only placed limits on the temptation you face, but he has provided the way of escape as well. What a gracious God we serve, amen? Yes. We have already seen that one of the ways that you can endure temptation, it's fleeing from sin. Run away from it. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we saw that God said uh, he's going to provide a way of escape. In the very next verse, Paul says, Therefore, brothers, flee from idolatry. Flee from sin. Run away from it just like Joseph did at a Potiphar's house. Get away no matter what it takes. Now, let me give you a word of caution here, believer. Watch out for the rationalization that your flesh will try to use in this area. Remember we talked about that deception that your mind plays? I can't tell you how many believers that I have seen over the years who struggle with alcohol. They can't have just a glass of wine. A glass of wine turns into a bottle of wine and intoxication. I can't tell you how many of those folks I've seen and heard say, well, I go to the bar and I go to parties where alcohol is because Jesus hung out with sinners too. You know what I say in response? I say, you're right. Jesus couldn't help but to hang out with sinners. He didn't have a choice. If he was going to hang out with anybody, he was going to hang out with sinners. So yes, you're right. He did hang out with sinners. But take me to Scripture and show me one place where Jesus was at, where there was sin going on, and he kept quiet. And he didn't offer a rebuke and the gospel. Show me one place. Now, if you're going to go to the bar, and you're going to go to that party, and you're going to explicitly share the gospel with those people, and listen, I'm not talking about that tired old line about preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. Not talking about that. I'm talking if you're going to explicitly tell them about Jesus Christ and how he can free them from the sin in their life, then great. But do you know what? I haven't heard anybody say that's what they were going to do. The only thing I've heard people say is, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to be there. As if your presence magically is going to transform their life. Our deceitful hearts, our flesh, will do everything it can to lull us into a place of complacency about our sin. It will deceive us. Flee from sin, brothers and sisters. God has given you a means of escape, and often that means of escape is to escape, is to leave. But look here at verse 18. He said, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. When God brings us to salvation, he begins in us the process of sanctification. He begins in us that, that being made holy, being conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. He takes out that heart of stone that we have when we're dead in our sins, and he replaces it with the heart of flesh that's sensitive to our sin and seeks to please God. He doesn't leave us wondering, though, how we can please him. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that he didn't say, you're saved, go live a holy life, and figure it out on your own? I'm afraid many Christians try to live that way because they don't read this. They don't spend time in this. They don't study it. They don't memorize it. They don't immerse themselves in it. They don't think about it and meditate on it. Instead, they try to do it on their own. But we have the revealed word of God. We have what the Bible says it calls itself sufficient for whatever we may face. 
It is sufficient. It is, it is full. If we will spend our time in it, if we will be shaped by it, we will be, just as Paul said at the end of 2 Timothy 3.17, complete and equipped for every good work. That's where we need to be. Psalm 119. Many of us know Psalm 119, the trivia answer, right? It's the longest chapter in the Bible. It's right in the middle. It's huge. It's, it's big. It's long. It's a poem. Did you know that the whole of Psalm 119 is about Scripture? Every bit of it. It is a poem written in love for God's Word. It's beautiful. And, and in verses 9 through 11, the psalmist writes, How can a young man keep his way pure? In other words, how can he resist giving in to temptation? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then in verse 165, he says, Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing that can quiet the tempted heart like reciting the word of God. Being in the word will quiet temptation. God has provided you a means of escape, the refuge of his holy word. We've been speaking about resisting temptation this morning. And it is a message that's geared largely to believers because the ways to endure temptation are provided to those who have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you don't have him in your life, if he is not your Lord and Savior, then the only thing you're going to be able to resist is temptation for a short time. You have a sinful nature. You will give in to it. But what's worse is you'll see nothing really wrong with it. But the Bible speaks about it. It says that that sin, even one little sin, separates you from God. It causes you to be lost. It causes you to be children of wrath and in, in, in your deserving of God's punishment in hell. But praise God, he has provided a way for you to be saved through his son, Jesus Christ. And so this morning as we close, I... If you feel that call in your life, if you feel the Holy Spirit pulling on you, saying, you, need, you, you are a sinner. You have not lived up to God's law. And you hear the Spirit say, today is the day to give that sin to him. Be washed of it and be forgiven. I'm going to be right down here at the bottom of the steps. I want you to come and talk to me. I want to tell you more about Jesus and what it means to be saved. But brothers and sisters, if you're here and you've been struggling with temptation, I think that's pretty much all of us. We all struggle with it in some way or another. I pray that you listen to the words of James. Know that every good gift, every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He is good and perfect and he has provided you with the means to endure and escape temptation. And he's going to use that tool that the devil tries to leverage to get you to sin in order to help build up your endurance, to build up your patience, and to conform you more and more to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the promise of your word. We thank you for the truth that it has for us. Father, we ask you, to help us to endure temptation in our lives through the power of your word, through the power of your Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Father, we know that you will not allow us to be in temptation that we cannot endure by your power. When we try to endure it on our own, we fail. Father, help us to remember to look to your word, to hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Help us to immerse ourselves in it, study it, learn it, memorize it so that we can go into battle armed. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know you, that you will draw them to yourself, that you will, you will work in their heart to replace that heart of stone that is sinful with the heart of flesh. And Father, that they will say, 
Lord, forgive me. Lord, I want to follow you. That they will count everything else as loss for the sake of knowing you. And we will rejoice with all of heaven over that one who is saved. We ask all of this in the name of our powerful and mighty Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.